just thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself so that you know why I'm up here. Basically, I've been 30 years about working for multinationals and the nutrition and the pharmaceutical business. And the last seven of those, I've been in charge of the, uh, the operating unit for, for Pfizer Nutrition. That means that I look after the manufacturing and supply of the products globally. We're in about 60 different countries. We have manufacturing locations uh, all the way from Mexico, Europe, uh, down to Asia. We've got some very significant operations in Asia. And we have third-party manufacturing for us in, uh, in New Zealand and in Europe as well. Uh, so the last five years I actually spent, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm back in Ireland about a year, and the previous five years I spent in Singapore uh, looking after the growth of the business, the nutrition business in, um, in Asia. And during the, those uh, five years, our business grew at a compound annual growth rate of 15%. Uh, and, you know, it's still growing. It's not quite growing at that pace right now, but I'm going to show you some information in a while about, you know, what the potential for this business is in the future. Uh, and one of the things what we did down there was it grew the capacity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later as to, you know, ours is a consumer business. It's also a very high-end quality business. Uh, but our customers are in Asia. 60% of our business is in Asia. It's a long way away from here. So, you know, even that, you know, it's a great opportunity for Ireland, but it's a hell of a long way to send your product. So, you know, that's part of the reason why we did our expansions down there. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a cowpuncher by background, uh, like many of the people here. Uh, I came out of uh, UCC many, many moons ago. Um, no, we're, we're in trouble again. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is our customers. Uh, and our customers are all the people that are represented on the edge of this picture here. We, we, we serve a wide range of customers. But primarily I want to focus on, on this picture in the middle. This is a premature infant, and you can imagine the size of your hands, you're holding that infant in there. And the reason for putting up this, this photograph is to remind everybody is that we, our product is the sole source of nutrition for that infant for the first six months of its life. So our customers are about as sensitive as you can possibly imagine. We cannot afford, and what I tell our employees in our factory is, factories are, we cannot afford to have our first mistake. We can never, the reason why we can't afford to have our first mistake is because of the impact that it can have on the life of that tiny person that you see here. And secondly, for the impact on the reputation of our company that we'll have. And we live in a global environment. If we've got a problem with an infant formula somewhere in Indonesia or in Philippines or in Australia, within seconds, it's across the globe in terms of the internet communication and it affects the reputation in every single part of our business across the globe. So the quality of what we do and the quality of the raw materials that we use and the quality of the, the, the whole reputation of, of where we get our milk and where we source our milk is really critical to us. And, and I think we have to actually to owe a lot to our Department of Agriculture uh, representatives, some of whom are here today, in terms of the standards that have been uh, put in place in Ireland over many, many years. And I keep telling people, I mean, a new company, Pfizer, who don't know anything about the infant formula business, took us over some time ago, and they keep asking me questions. And when I, they talk to me about milk, and I, I say to them, well, when we buy milk, we're actually not buying milk. We're buying something that comes from uh, a layers and layers of regulatory environment. We're buying something that we have confidence in. We're buying something called trust. And that's really, really important. And I think it's been raised a couple of times today. Um, I wasn't entirely in agreement with some of the, some of the vibes from uh, Minister Coveney in terms of, you know, that cost us a lot in the past. You know, I think that's the price of entry. And that's the, that's, we can't forget that for a second. So that's our customers. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong here. The next thing I'm looking at our products, just to give you an idea of what our products are. Uh, this is the kind of range that we've got. It's, it's powdered milk with a, a lot of modifications to it, a lot of additions, a lot of key ingredients that we add during our process. Uh, and we're, we're dealing, you can see the numbers one, two, three, and four on this. Originally, way back in the 70s when we started making product in Ireland, it was for, for infants only. But that the market has grown to a second age. You know, people are from infants from a year up, third age from two, fourth age, fifth age. So our, our, our market keeps growing, which is really go good to see. And you can see we're making a range of, uh, of powder products, liquid products, tetra packs, stick packs, you know, for convenience purposes as well. So these are products that we make and we sell across the globe. Uh, I'll let you, let you manage it for me. If you can flick to the next slide as well, please, right? 
The vision, the vision for the company, I just want to talk about it for a second, is, and you know, a lot of people, you talk about visions, and a vision is um, something usually the eyes glaze over because it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So we've got a vision like everybody else. But I want to do emphasize in terms of what our vision is in relation to uh, what we're talking about. The first piece is here is our vision and our aim is to become the most trusted nutrition company in the world. And right now, let, let, me, let me just pose a question for you, a little bit of a rhetorical question is, who trusts anybody in the current environment? Every time you pick up a newspaper, every time you pick up and you hear a media story, it's all about where people have betrayed trust in some way over the past. And food is no different from that. Um, you know, again, I had the, the privilege of working in Asia and, and visiting China uh, uh, during the course, ju just before the, the melamine crisis happened. I was there with a couple of other Irish guys, and we were, we've, we've built a plant in, in China in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and one of the things we were looking for was, well, what should we be doing about our milk supply for, for that plant? And we went on a tour and we did a look at, at what was available. And when we finished our tour, we looked at each other and we said, from what we've seen, there's too many risks associated with the milk supply here. That was, I remember it very well, it was just before the Beijing Olympics. And within two weeks of the finish of the Olympics, the whole menamine crisis had, had struck in China. And we looked at each other again and we said, thank God we made those kind of decisions. But you cannot, this is really, really critical for us uh, to, to constantly emphasize the fact that we've got to have this base. And I think it's something that we need to talk about more as we go on. So anyway, our vision is to talk about, is to be the tr most trusted company in the world. It's something that's earned, earned over a long period of time, lost very quickly. And obviously, one of the ways in which we're going to deliver that is, is the kind of topic I'm going to talk about, which is innovation and clinically based. I've underlined those two items for you because clinically based means it's talking about health food claims. We're all familiar with claims that are being made on all our products all the time. There's a very strong regulatory environment covering our business that does not allow us to make claims anymore unless they're clinically based. So we can't say closer to breast milk, we can't say all those kind of things. We've got to say, here's the evidence, here's the scientific evidence based on clinical study as to why it is better, and we've obviously got to be in that. That's the area and that's the, that's the game we've got to play. And that's a game that we can play with the help of a lot of people who are in this room uh, who I was look, talking to earlier. Okay, so just to talk a tiny bit about the, the market, first of all, you can go ahead to the next, you can flick the next two sections, please, right? So the market is, is a growing market. I mentioned we had a compound annual growth rate of 15% in our business over the previous few years. The market in t for pediatric nutrition products is growing at around 8%. That's what it's for, forecast to look at. Who are the players down there? The big players are, are the five people that are there. I've put ourselves in the middle as the biggest player. That's not true, but that's just me. That's my emphasis on it, my take on it. Uh, it's really interesting you'd look at the five, five players there. You're probably familiar with most of them. But I have a big box down at the bottom there called local players. And this is, the, this is as people understand and get to know uh, the infant nutrition business and the possibilities within it, a lot of local players jumped in. They jumped in with two feet, and they took some of our market share away over the years. But guess what's happened since the, the succession of crises in the, uh, in the food business over the years in China and other, uh, uh, especially Asian countries, is these, lo these local players have been found out. And in fact, the trend for, for the local players uh, taking over market share has actually reversed, not through anything of our actions, but through the whole scandals and the whole basis of trust that has come around um, and has really driven that change. So it's something that we should be very uh, interested and focused in. Okay, so in terms of, I, I'm not going to dwell on this, but basically we're, I'm talking about innovation uh, and the Pfizer's, uh, Pfizer's uh, re reputation in this business is, is really excellent. We've been the first to introduce a, ho a long uh, amount of, uh, of innovations in our business over the years. We're known as a scientific company that is always innovating to bring in new, uh, new ingredients, new additions. Some of them I've mentioned here, I won't dwell on anyone in particular. But there are opportunities in this list of things, and, I, and I'll just refer, if you say second from the bottom, there is a, a, a alpha lactalbumin, which is one of the, the, the byproducts of the whey, whey industry. Um, a number of years ago, we, um, we introduced that. We actually, it was, an it was an opportunity for Ireland to actually get involved in that business. We actually couldn't find a supplier in Ireland. Eventually, we went abroad. We're actually importing that product today into Ireland from the US and, from, and also from Europe. And it's a kind of an opportunity for us for the future. 
And these are the kind of opportunities that we need to talk about and we need to be ready to take as, as time goes on. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So you can move on. So the next couple of slides are, I'm going to talk about innovation and, and the process of innovation. And what I'm going to talk about is like it's motherhood and apple pie, to be honest with you. It's, it's something that is, uh, that everybody, you can find in any textbook, but at the same time, I said, is worth emphasizing it. Uh, first of all, it's, you know, it, innovation is based on consumer insights. At the end of the day, that's where it starts and that's where it finishes. It starts with the customer, finishes with the customer, and what you do in between is up to you to speed it up, to do it as fast as possible, to do it as creatively as possible, but the fundamental is consumer insights and the fundamental is satisfying customer demand at the other end of it. So I think that's something everybody knows, but it's worth mentioning again. And the next slide shows the detail of how we, how we involve that in, in um, how we do that in Pfizer. I would have to say, we're not as good as this as we'd like to be. Uh, you know, this is a nice chart. It shows how, how we start with ideation, idea development. We have teams on, on the left-hand side of the chart that are focused on looking at what are the, the big picture ideas, what are the, the brainstorming sessions, and then we work through a stage gate process, those two little boxes at the bottom are stage gates where we talk about uh, uh, looking at feasibility of the concepts and then we put it into the, into the portfolio, and then we start to work on it. And the idea is that we want to do the minimum amount of work before we put anything into the portfolio, because too often in the past, we've done a lot of work to bring uh, projects to almost to fruition, only to discover that they don't meet some of the critical criteria. So we've wasted effort, and that effort could be going into good, other good projects. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just showing uh, the, the thought process and the way in which it works. I wish we were better at it. We are, we're, we're getting much better at it, but you know, I think like every company, I think there's room for us to improve, and I think there's room, it, you know, I'm just setting it up here so that everybody knows this is the kind of way that we do it. Uh, and we've got all kinds of layers of teams that work on this, and we're working very hard to try and improve this. So I won't dwell on the slide, it's just to say that there is a, a process there. The process is pretty standard, but it's, What's really important is the rigor and the discipline to actually carry it out. And too often, even to this day, within our own business, we get somebody who has the bright idea who wants to make sure that they get that done immediately. And sometimes there's great value in those ideas, but it's also, it's also very important that we don't fall flat on our face by, you know, by, by circumventing the process too much and finding that we've missed some of the critical information as we go forward. So let's move on. Uh, the kind of thought process, again, that goes into it is... is uh, you know, these things are very, are very important, these thoughts that are on this uh, slide here. I'll let you read them yourselves, but, uh, you know, talking about alignment with the business strategy is really important, especially in a business like ours, and it would be applied to a lot of other businesses as well. But one thing you have to remember is that the strategy should change. The strategy doesn't always remain the same, so you need to change your strategy as you go forward, uh, depending on the circumstances and what things are, are happening and what you're seeing in the business. So you need to be careful that you're actually evaluating the strategy as you're doing your uh, innovation program. But all the other things that are here, we talk about barriers to entry, how easy it is to copy people, you know, the, the non-risk adjusted incremental revenue, one of the great pitfalls people say is, well, you know, if, all, if everything goes right, the wind is in our sails and the, wind and the sun is on our back, you know, this is what we'll get. But we really need to be very realistic about what happens when, you know, when things go wrong. How, how are you capable? How is your project? How does it stand up? And obviously, in our business, regulatory support, regulatory approval is very important, making sure that we can, uh, you know, stand up to all the scrutiny of all the regulatory agencies across the world that we deal with. So I'm just going to give you a very quick case study of, of uh, and, and this case study is just an example of what we did in the last little while. So we'll just go through the next couple of slides. Uh, the first one is, you know, this is, this is Pidgin English, translated directly from Chinese, because this uh, feedback came from our Chinese market, saying, the battle on the table, every day I need to chase the baby for feeding, and we're not talking about infants now, we're talking about toddlers at this point, right? And the baby eats little and slowly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the direct translation. So we'll look at the next slide, if you click again. I, for those of you who have children in the audience, I, I ask you, does any of this ring any bells, right? You know, the, the kid, children who just don't want to eat. And in every family, I know it in my own family and, and my extended family, I know several cases of what we call picky eaters. So... The characteristics of a picky eater are basically that they skip meals, they don't want to eat, they don't want to eat when you want them to eat, they only want to eat certain foods, they'll eat fast foods in particular, and don't want to eat what you want. 
So effectively, there's a real dietary need um, uh, out there for people who have this picky eater condition, and it's, it's a big worry for a lot, of, a lot of families. I know families who really worry very greatly about how their kids are there. So what, was our, what did we want to do with that? So we got that feedback, so if we move to the next slide. We said our goal for Picky Eater was to provide a, a better source of complete balanced nutrition for the hard to feed child with more protein, less sucrose, less fat, 100% of key vitamins and nutrients. So basically, we provide all the needs of the infants in three feedings per day. And we've got to make sure it tastes good because Picky Eaters ain't going to eat the, the food unless, it's, unless it tastes good. So effectively, we put those ideas, went through that process that we, that we went through, we fast tracked it. Uh, through the process that we talked about. And at the other end of it, we came out with what, this is a, this I think is a can from Thailand. Um, it's a global product. It's a new picky eater formula. And if you had eyes good enough, you could see this is ideal for, for picky eaters. Uh, it was originally launched in China about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, it's got an absolutely fantastic consumer reaction. It's, a, it's now become a global launch for us. We're, we're, we've gone across the globe with it, not everywhere yet. And we are seeing sales growth far beyond our expectations. So it's just a good example of where we saw consumer, consumer insight. And consumer insight was one that everybody could see for a long, long time. But we were fortunate we had good people uh, to, to pick that up. And uh, it turned out to be a successful project. Now, I have to tell you, we're not alone in the business. We have uh, those competitors you saw down there. You know, everybody, everybody else sees it, and our business is one whereby, you know, somebody else piles in pretty quickly after you go with the first idea, or if they go with the first idea, we're quick to follow them in as well. So innovation is the name of the game for us, and it's being first in there is really important. So having said that, I just wanted to talk a moment for about uh, alliances. You can't do this on your own. Uh, you can't do innovation on your own. And I just thought I'd, on the next slide, I wanted to show up some of the possible alliances that we, we can have uh, in, for us operating out of Ireland. I said, well, let's, let's look at it out of Ireland and see where are the, where are the places we can go for help to help us to, uh, to, be, uh, to be successful. Again, I'm not going through the list of people that are up here, but I'm just giving examples of research centers, of you know, uh, suppliers, of um, equipment suppliers, of material suppliers, of educational uh, places where we can go. There's a lot of help out there. There's a lot of places we can go to get help to assist us along the way. And I have to say, we use that help uh, very, very, uh, very greatly, not just, obviously, not just in, in Europe, but we obviously use it in globally as well. So because ours is a global business with a global uh, uh, product portfolio. So if you want to do, for the, my message for you, if you want to do something, go out and reach help. The people are there. We sign confidentiality agreements with these folks. It's very, very important for us in our business that we sign those confidentiality agreements. And generally speaking, we've been very happy with the, with the results. Um, so that's just an example of what, and if I want to specifically look at Ireland then, on the next slide, you know, I'm very happy to say that we work very closely with, um, uh, with Chagosk, with uh, Moore Park, the pay folks in Moore Park. Um, and obviously with the academic institutions. We actually have uh, about 30 people uh, doing full-time product development work based in our Askeaton location. Um, some of them are actually uh, gone down to spend their time in Moore Park and are actually based in Moore Park now. But you know, there is a tremendous amount of very good resources available in this country who can help us. So I would encourage anybody who has ideas and who has plans and progress to do it is to make sure to contact these people. So I think that's... That's it in terms of the really good news. In terms of, well, what are the issues that we've had in front of us? I think there's a few things that I just wanted to talk about is that um, the food issues, first of all, is Ireland, even that I heard it, I heard everybody talk today about the, the growth in the, in, in, in the business. A lot of the growth is happening in Asia, in the developing, developing markets. I heard uh, the last speaker say, well, doesn't, don't, don't expect to see much growth in, in Europe. And that's the issue for people for people in the business like I'm in, is that you know we need to get product from here to, to Asia. Well, it takes six weeks on a boat to send the product from here to Asia. It takes another two weeks to get it through customs, so you're talking about eight weeks. And we're talking about, we, we package all our product into its finished product here in Ireland. Um, it's too expensive to air freight it. You can't, you can't air freight this stuff because it's just too heavy. So uh, an eight week delivery time uh, across fr from here is just too long. It's absolutely too long for our business. 
So therefore we need, and we are expanding our, our operations in Asia as a result of that. We, don't, we, we can't afford to have that kind of time. That's not to say there isn't room for the business, there is room for it, but certainly that's a challenge for us as we go forward. And actually in recent times we are not, a little bit in the past just to give you an example, we did a, we did a, um, a project where supplying, we went to a traditional type cooperative environment to supply some of our finished products on a third party manufacturing basis, not out of Ireland. And uh, we went and we started up and we thought we were going to have a great success with these people. But we realized very quickly is that the, the model that, that this company had was a bulk production model of skim milk powder and uh, lactose and whey powders, etc. Weren't at all consumer uh, uh, conscious in the way that we need to be because we're talking about you know, the specific uh, uh, the specific product SKU, the, the sales, sales unit that the, that the customer is seeing. And, and when we would say, well, we got an over, an over sales of X, we want, we want uh, a, new pro a new level, new run of production, they couldn't do it for us. They weren't geared around that level. So I think that's a message that we need to think in terms of our flexibility in, uh, in, in Ireland, in terms of our industry as well, is that you know, we need to be thinking about the actual customer. Uh, the final, final customer, not the intermediate customer. We need to be able to figure out how we're going to, uh, to serve that need better. Uh, cost, I've been here, right? And I heard a minister, uh, the minister's speech this morning, and it's good to hear the costs are going to come down. Um, I'm not sure whether that's really the case or not, but it's certainly, we, we, product, our product is not the cheapest out of Europe. Uh, that we can, make, we can manufacture our product and deliver it to our markets cheaper out of some of our other locations elsewhere. So we need to be careful about this. Uh, I have to say that on the other hand, our productivity of our Irish employees is probably the highest, it is the highest that we have anywhere in our, in our business. That's a, great, that's a great thing, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a while because we need to preserve that. That's our future, is the productivity of our employees and being able to, 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 uh, to leverage that. So if I move on to the next slide, I'm just, maybe first of all, you can click the next button if you don't mind, is, uh, the opportunities and challenges, first of all, is uh, trust and reputation. I talked about it at the beginning, and I, 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 want, I want to finish up by talking about it here as well, is the foresight to know what's coming next is going to be important. Uh, BSE cost us a lot of problems, and I, I was personally involved with, a, uh, with people coming to visit the country to find out our BSE program because it was impacting our infant formula manufacturer, believe it or not, some years back. So BSE is all retreated into the distance, but who knows what's coming next? Uh, we need the foresight to understand what's coming next. We need the regulation to cover it. I, I've, the word embracement, I, know, I don't know if it actually exists, but I made it up for this, right? We need to embrace those regulations. Everybody in the industry needs to embrace the regulations, and we need to enforce them. And you know what? That applies. When, when I was putting that together, I was talking about this to somebody, and they said, well, that could apply to our financial uh, situation in the country as well. So I, I think this, it's, a, it's a message that goes across everything. So I think that business of trust and reputation, and I just mentioned something else, our tax spaces, right? Our tax situation is a measure of, a matter of trust for the people who do business, the multinationals who come here and do business. The day we go out and say we're going to tweak it by, you know, we're going to reduce the, the tax benefits, that's the day our trust is gone. And I can tell you that'll be the day when we'll see uh, no inward investment in this, in this uh, country coming in from a lot of the tra traditional people who've been doing the inward investment. So tax is going to be very important. So this trust and reputation thing are really important for us. Uh, I've titled the next comment here, Drive for Food. You know, we've seen in the last couple of weeks a great initiative that took place on the biotechnology area. Okay, uh, um, I'll be finished in one second, right? In the biotechnology area, we've got this great big new uh, center for there. I, I think, what about the drive for food? We could, we could actually mirror that for, for food. We've got a great lot of resources, but we could do with a lot more to help us to be innovative and to be able to compete in the world market because it's the innovative things that are going to make the day for us. Talent development in the food industry and the research community, really, really important about talent development. Um, we certainly, our, our comments at the moment is we're seeing very good people come out to us. We're very productive, but we've got to keep it coming. We believe that there's a gap right now between the readiness of graduates who are coming out to be ready for, to hit the ground running uh, for our business. And we have to spend a lot of time building them up so that they're in a position where they can start helping us. I think we, that's a challenge for the academic community to, to, to manage that. I talk about embracing risk and support of innovation. Innovation doesn't come cheaply. Sometimes you get burned. You have to be able to take those hits uh, and go forward. And I talked about for customer focus earlier. So that's it, folks. Thanks very much for listening.